Hey everyone, I'm Patrick Jones, and welcome to episode 46 of That Gives Me Anxiety. Oof, bit of a bit, bit of a long week last week. If you've been listening, I was in New York visiting family and had a wedding, but but didn't make it that full uh, week. Unfortunately, Jamie and a few other people at the wedding came down with COVID. We were visiting my parents after the wedding. So we rented a car and canceled our flights and drove all the way back from... Long Island to Charleston in one shot, which we've done a few times, It, but it uh, it was elongated based on the amount of traffic and construction. So, you know, I'm complaining, right? Like I, I had a, just a ton of caffeine, but Jamie having COVID, can you imagine a fever, coughing, COVID, right? This thing that we've all been trying to avoid, except she had to do it with a 16 hour drive, just like. Oh, gosh. <laughs> but it's okay. My parents didn't didn't get it. And somehow I didn't get it. Some combination of having it in early June and the booster that I got the week before is blocking it for me. <laughs> I actually don't mind. I actually don't mind road trips. So, you know, really like doing them, in fact. But just, you know, you're, you're mentally prepared for it and to just have to, like, switch your brain from oh shit jamie has covid i gotta rent a car we gotta get out of here it's a little less fun right part of the fun of a road trip is having the flexibility to do whatever you want not like oh god we gotta go we gotta go well i've got a great episode lined up for you here we're gonna introduce you to art therapy which is a really fun and and somewhat different way of approaching therapy my guest is Lindsay letterman who's an art therapist herself, and the clinical director of the Art Therapy Project. So helping to spread the uh, the good news of art therapy. In our discussion, we talk about what art therapy is, what it can feel like, and, and how it can be helpful, and who might be interested, in, and how to get involved. All of the <laughs> who, what, where, why, and how. All of it. I covered it all. Journalist. But before we get to Lindsay, I just want to remind you, if you're liking the show, to please remember to rate and review it positively i hope you know you can check the show out on facebook instagram twitter and or youtube and if you're liking the show and you want to support it and support me you can do that by making a donation through the buy me a coffee link in the description description well i'm certainly bummed about everything i missed out on in new york having to cut the trip short but glad we got back here safely and and jamie's feeling better covid's still a thing it really is <laughs> As always, thank you so much for listening and enjoy. Joining me now on the podcast, I have Lindsay Letterman, who's a an art therapist and, and among other things. Lindsay, thank you so much for, for being here. Thank you, Patrick. I'm excited to chat with you today. Yeah, I'm excited to dig into art therapy. It's it's something that I really don't know too much about. And I'm excited to hear and, and hopefully give the listeners a little bit more background on what it is and how it can help them and all that good stuff. So uh, why don't we start off by you introducing yourself to everybody? Sure. Well, first, I'm, I'm so glad that you are having me on. Art therapy is kind of young in its time in the mental health field. And I, I'm so lucky I found this career because uh, it's amazing. So I, I love sharing this with people. Um, right. Yeah. So, um, you know, I am um, a clinician, an art therapist. I've been practicing for about 15 years. Uh, my master's is from the School of Visual Arts in New York. Okay. Um, you know that you know it. Yeah. Yeah. I lived in New York for 10 years. Uh, so there you go. Yeah. <laughs> It's, um, they have a fabulous program. There's a few programs in New York, many across the country. And, you know, I worked in the hospital system for about eight years in New York. And then I started an art therapy program at a children's hospital outside of New York. And I came back here for the role that I'm in now. I'm the clinical director at an incredible nonprofit called the Art Therapy Project. We're based out of New York. We do free group art therapy for trauma survivors of all ages. And we were really uh, excited to get to connect with Preston Zeller, who had me in his documentary about the art of grieving and the work that we do at the Art Therapy Project. You know, we've been around for 10 years. We've worked with over 8,000 people. And so I'm very lucky, like I said, to have found this. 
That's awesome. Yeah, you can tell just watching you for people who aren't watching you as you speak, the excitement is is clear in your voice, but also in in your body and your face. Like this is, it's so nice to watch somebody who's like, yeah, I found this great thing that I'm doing and now that's my job and it's awesome. Yeah, yeah. thank <laughs> so you. So I'm happy for you. Since it's so new, is there, well, why don't we, why don't we start, why don't we back up a little bit and provide a little bit more context about someone comes to you, are, are they coming to you with art therapy in mind already? Or how does that usually work? Yeah, I think a lot of people, it's funny because when I graduated, it was much less heard of and mm-hmm. people would like look at me cross-eyed at the bars or wherever I was going out and had like wild guesses about what it could be. And and today you hear a little bit more like, oh, I have a friend who's in school for that, or my cousin knows someone. So it's getting a little more um, steam and a little more into the mainstream. But when people come to us, they've 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 either identified as someone who needs something else besides traditional talk therapy, and through their own research, have seen online usually our, um, art therapy or all the creative arts therapies. Some people have experienced art therapy in either like a rehab inpatient in their school sometimes. And so they get kind of introduced in that way. And I have a lot of people who say they just started Googling because they're creatives and they also want like an extra layer of more professional support. And so that's how people have found us. But yeah, it's still not your traditional means of psychotherapy, which I hope changes because we have all the tools to provide that and the extra additional training and understanding of using the creative process to really help people access those parts and pieces of ourselves that we sometimes don't have access to because of there's no language for some of this um, right. or it's in our unconscious somewhere that we're not even aware of. So it's so unique and it's so helpful to so many people. Uh, and I hope that more people are able to find it. That's great. Yeah, I I know exactly what you mean about sometimes there aren't the words to express, like times that I've been really anxious or depressed or grieving or whatever. It feels like this whirlwind, like the Tasmanian devil, like spinning and and there's brain fog. And when you try to communicate that to someone, you, you know, especially someone who's not a mental health professional, like a friend or whatever, it comes out like, disjointed and and it's not clear so it's kind of nice from the perspective of like you can be a little bit more abstract there's another way to communicate those feelings yeah I mean it's such a cliche an image a picture is worth a thousand words and you know our our first form of communication as humans was with cave drawings and that's how we were communicating language developed out of that and so even just you describing the Tasmanian devil I'm just like I see that in pictures and when you're in, if you were in a session and you were saying something like that, and we did a drawing or a piece of art around that, now here exists that thought outside of yourself, outside of just mm-hmm. a, co- a cognitive, imaginary, you know, something feeling. And so you can interact with it. So like, it just brings to mind a really cool example. I had someone who, who described their anxiety um, very specifically, very close to that as like a jumble of intertwined things that are just Tasmanian devil-like, right? And so we, she, she drew it. And I said, while you're drawing it, just give a different color to lines that might represent different parts of where that feeling is coming from. So is it work stress? Is it relationship? Is it, is it money? What, what are all the things that might be in there and give them each a different color? It doesn't, it doesn't matter. And what we were able to do was quite literally take each piece of that swirl, pull it out, create a piece of art around that and really start to understand and take down and you know, inspect what each of those things are so she could deal with them. Because when they're all in a jumble, where do, how do you even start? It's too much, right? That's with anxiety and, and grief and all of these big feelings. It's just like, sometimes it's too much that we just wanna like stay away from it. So here we can break it down to more manageable parts and begin to look at it, examine it, understand it and begin to address it. That's great. I mean, that even applies forget about like the daunting aspect of anxiety or, or grief or depression. If you have to move, it's like, oh, it becomes this heavy thing. It's like, all right, but how do I even think about starting? And, and so that's great to like give a roadmap 
Uh, yeah, and it, it, um, thank you for pointing that out because I think with the art therapy project, we work specifically with, with survivors, but art therapy is not just for trauma, but the fact that it's so well understood as it relates to trauma and the understanding of where trauma is stored in the brain and all those intense emotions, everyday stressors. We, we're living in a global pandemic. I mean, there are things that are very real for people who might not necessarily identify as someone who has trauma, but everyday stress, just being people in the world today, this is just a fabulous way to be able to help manage some of that um, overwhelm that I think a lot of us kind of just deal with on the regular. Yeah. Can we talk? I know you've got a lot on your plate. You've got work. You've got friends, you've got family, pets, you've got the people that you make small talk with at the coffee shop or gym. You've got that bird that you see when you wake up every morning outside your window that you've projected things onto. Look at that bird. Doesn't even love its family. It's always by itself. You do that. Everyone does that. Point is, you've got a lot on your plate. Well, that's why there's Instacart to take a little bit off your plate. Using Instacart, you search for all your favorite foods and things that you need from the grocery store, all online, all while you're looking at that bird, wondering why it hasn't called its mom. And they deliver it to you. They go to the store and do the shopping for you. And they can deliver it in as fast as an hour. And you can sign up by clicking the link in the description, wherever you're listening or watching. And that's a great way of supporting the show. So it's a great way of supporting this show. It's a great way to make your life a little bit easier because we all know that you have so much going on, like wondering whether that bird judges you back. It's so funny that I'm learning about this now. There was one time, I think it was like 2016, where I was hitting like a very, very deep low. And I just had the impulse to go to an art store and, and, paint some stuff and and it was nice it was I, I showed it to people as this is it, I ended up drawing like a kind of like a stick figure I, I still have it actually a stick figure that was like empty and hollow and I was like this is kind of how I feel and it was nice in that regard to just do that Yes. It's so interesting you say that because I recently, um, the Art Therapy Project has also been doing a lot of virtual workshops for organizations and companies around the U.S. that are realizing that their staff is like exhausted and burnt out and they want to do these like wellness workshops. And I had multiple people in there say that during the pandemic, they like went and, and got like colored pencils just because they just needed something to do. And that they were like finding that just immensely helpful. They didn't know why exactly, but mm -hmm. like, they were like, what, what is that? And so one of the great things about just being creative, not, not exclusive to art therapy, we don't own art, is that getting to reconnect with that. Like when's the last time someone gave you time and space to be playful again and just make art not for not the paint and sip where you're all going to end up with the same sunset which is also cool but <laughs> but just like play right and just get back and, and that's like this little part of ourselves especially as adults that we lose over time because we have jobs and we have families and responsibilities mm -hmm. so a lot of the workshop participants have mentioned that and I want to say because it's so funny you said stick figures because so many people like art therapy like I can't even draw a stick figure why why should I do art therapy it doesn't make sense for me it's so important I want everyone to know Art therapists are trained in understanding the use of art materials and different media. You do not have to be an artist to do art therapy. It is just about getting creative and getting in there. And I'll say, I'll share personally, when I found art therapy, I was always like creative as a, a kid and a, and a teenager, not particularly talented. You know, I didn't have like people wanting to look at my stuff. I just like enjoyed it. And I actually just had like, I was taking art classes because I couldn't find a job after college and all these things. And I had a professor say like, your artwork has a lot of emotion. And that's how I heard of art therapy. And so being an artist is not a prerequisite. It's, it's for everyone and anyone. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. That, I mean, that leads me right to where my next question was, which is if someone comes to you and they're going to do art therapy for the first time. I'd imagine there's a lot of people that are like, well, it's, it's not going to be good. I need, this needs to be good. Uh, how do you help somebody just put paintbrush to, to 
paper? Great question. And we do, we have, the, you know, it's the range, like I said, the ra range of people that come to us for art therapy, some who identify as artists and they're like, I can't wait, give me those art materials, I'm ready to go. <laughs> and then just like you said, people who are like, oh. And what's really wonderful again about our training and our, our clinical experience is that we don't have to do art right away. You know, taking it's it's a risk, right? There's this, I'm gonna be judged, I'm gonna have those self-judgments, all of those things come up when you give someone a blank piece of paper and say, create. Um, if you're not someone who's confident or feels good about those creative skills. So you have all those fears that come up. And so I've spent weeks, sometimes months with people in session, not doing art and talking until we develop that rapport and sense of safety where they can take that leap and start creating. When I was working with kids, it wouldn't even, sometimes they would just be like rebellious. They just like, oh, I'm here for art therapy. My parents are sending me here. I'm not going to make art. And so part of it, you know, sometimes like I would like sketch in front of them or just doodle while they were talking. And I'd put some colored pencils or just a regular pencil and some paper out and just like model that I could be doodling. It doesn't matter. It doesn't have to be anything. So there's different like interventions and ways that we work with people to help them kind of, again, take that leap, especially if they don't identify as someone who feels confident about art making. And that's the beauty of being in a room with an art therapist. You know, there's creativity, which I think is beautiful and helpful for people, but the professional help and having someone there with you to, to give you that supportive safe space is a wonderful part of like our, our mental health profession. Yeah. Oh man, that sounds so wonderful. I'm so curious, how much do you intervene? I'd imagine there's you're kind of playing it by ear and watching how the person is progressing, but I, I'm interested to hear your perspective on, on when you're like, well, all right, why don't we try this? Yeah, this that's a great question. So a lot of the time and, and what we do in session is, is we're assessing, and, I, and this is a big misconception that we're like interpreting artwork, that we can tell you that that means that, and red means angry, and there's everything subjective. And so our role is to really assess and ask the right questions to help the individual who's coming to us for treatment make those decisions and associations for themselves and explore how that relates to their symptoms or their needs or what they're going through. So a good example about something specific in terms of intervention, I was talking with someone recently, color in art therapy is very much related to emotion. And so I used to work with teenagers, many of whom came from difficult backgrounds and had a lot of symptoms of depression, and they would only use pencil only pencil. So you're talking, you know, gray on white paper and they were engaging in art, which is good. But I was wondering about the absence of emotion in their artwork. And then also how that related to their emotional landscape, just in their life, and like what their difficulty was bringing in emotion. And so for me, the intervention is not like, Hey, why don't we, why don't you have to use colored pencils now? Cause I want you to see what emo I want to see the emotional side. But it's like, I'm going to put some colored pencils on the table. I might say a little bit, have you thought about adding color or not? And people are going to make their own decisions very much like with my personal approach, but I think a lot of art therapists, like a person-centered humanistic approach, we want to meet people where they're at. We're not the experts on you. You're the expert. We're just there to help you navigate the twists and turns that come with, with life. So, you know, I've put that, that pack of colored pencils on a, on a table and just alluded to them and said, hey, have you thought it might be nice? This is why. And giving a little psychoeducation around that so people understand why we might be suggesting or, or moving towards a different material. And sometimes people are like, sure, I, I want to try it. And other times it's no. And you keep kind of assessing and finding different ways to help people express those things and understanding what are we avoiding? What do we need exposure to? And maybe exploring even what the avoidance is around that. And with art therapy, what's so great, there's so many different mediums, you know, for someone coming in, that's like, you're asking me to, like you said, putting that paintbrush to the page, a blank page, scary, right? For some people, well, let's start with collage. Let's like, do you like to sew? Do you build things? There's all these different art media that we can use to even have like an inroad to that creative process to at least get going. And so there's a lot of options in terms of how art is used within sessions. 
your office sounds like it's just like a really fun uh, arts and crafts space. <laughs> it we, we are so lucky. The School of Visual Arts, uh, which again happens to be where I got my master's, but they also are a big supporter of the Art Therapy Project. They donate the space to us. We have a beautiful studio in downtown Manhattan with all the art supplies you could imagine. We get donations. We have our own budget. We're very lucky to um, be able to offer a good range and quality of material to the clients we work with. That's great. Yeah, that's so fun. Today's episode is sponsored by My Software Tutor. Can Excel be my friend? Do you want a new friend? Thinking about making new friends both makes me excited and sad. So it, it can be hard to make friends as you get older. And so I feel like sometimes you get surrounded by people. It's like, yeah, I guess we're friends. But also if you truly connect with someone, you can make new friends as, as, a, as an adult. On both sides of the fence here. <laughs> so Excel can be your friend, or it could be surrounding you. That's just probably because you don't know it that well. Many people have deviated so far from the copy. Let me get back to it. Can Excel be my friend? Many people have wondered this for years. The answer is, yes, it can. That was so much shorter than where I was going with it. All right, let's talk about my software tutor. They offer three levels of real-time Zoom-based courses with a live instructor. They all deliver practical, functional business skills in a friendly, supportive environment. That sounds nice. I mean, it could be so daunting to learn Excel or make friends. These courses will increase your marketability, whether you're an employee, job seeker, consultant, or contractor. That sounds pretty good. Register at mysoftwaretutor.com and use the promo code POD20 to save and use the promo code POD20 to save 20% off all rip rip rip. rip registrations <laughs> i imagine the the answer to this next question also falls within this spectrum of, of trying to figure out what the individual person but i guess i'm curious to hear how much time you spend talking about the actual art or is the art more just something you're doing to like remove the layers of like judging what you're about to say all and all of the above right um yeah. so depending on the person whether it's an individual session or a group session i've had sessions where the art in and of itself is doing the work and the talking mm -hmm. is not the, the emphasis, the metaphors that people engage in within their art process tell a story. And so I kind of let that unfold. And that's, again, done with this assessment. How much are people willing to go in there? Maybe people are more defended. I had a client who was like that and was, was not really processing his art. We call it processing when you talk about the art. But after like six months of working together, I say, can we look back? This is another wonderful thing about art therapy. You have a physical piece from your sessions, when you're in traditional talk therapy and you ask someone what you were dealing with six months ago, I mean, I, I don't know. I don't remember. Am I, did I make progress? Have I not made progress? Mm -hmm. So we did this review of his artwork, looking at kind of different points over the six months. And I was like, what are you, what are you noticing? And he was able to be like, oh my, I'm using these different colors. Okay. What do those colors like mean for you? Mm -hmm. Well, they're brighter. So, you know, that kind of think, makes me think of feeling better and happier. Like, do you feel better and happier? You know, so you kind of engage mm -hmm. in this conversation in this reflective process. But in typical sessions, yeah, you would process the artwork and talk about it and reflect on it, really giving it time to giving the client time to work on it without being like, what's that? And what's that? Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, uh, because you don't want to interrupt that kind of flow. It's almost like, you know, a stream of consciousness that comes out. You don't want to interrupt it. And then there, there are times where being able to share that artwork, like when within a group, like with the art therapy project and really let other people in and get to that vulnerable place of sharing is, is really, really incredibly powerful because I think so many of us carry some shame and some kind of, oh, mental health stuff shouldn't be shared and talked about. Mm -hmm. And you might feel very alone in your feelings. And so just like in like, again, a traditional group therapy, talk therapy, someone might feel uncomfortable sharing those things. But for a gr group art therapy, you can just hold up your artwork and share in that way and be seen without saying anything. So yeah. there's so much power to it. Really, there really is. I mean, going back to my limited experience with this, 
I connect with that. I made a series uh, during that time of like four paintings, all containing the same stick figure like character with different colors around it. And I can connect to how I felt there. It's almost, I want to call it like a trophy, except it's like a, a reminder of, of the lows, right? It, it, I, it's, a, it's a complex emotion that I'm trying to unpack right now <laughs> in front of you, but I'm sure you've, you've had people talk about things like in that manner. It's like I, I, do, I do keep it around as a, as a trophy and a reminder of why it's important to take mental health so seriously. Oh. I love, I love hearing that you did that. And you know, I'm going to ask, I want to see all that stuff. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, it's an imprint, right? It's an imprint of that moment in, in your life and it represents it. And that's again, something so unique to art therapy is that you have those imprints. And so you can have reminders of the difficulties. You can also have a reminders of the, the successes and the, 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 the triumphs and the beautiful, I've done this in session where people create artwork that reminds them of something quite difficult. And what we talk about is like, where does that need to go? Like, do you need distance from it? So here you're able to take that feeling out of your mind, create it on a piece of paper. And maybe like today it's too much. So we might make a box or a folder or a safe space for it. So we're not deleting it from our memory. We are allowing it to exist but also giving ourselves some relief from being overwhelmed by it. And so that ability to control and kind of titrate how much you connect with those difficult thoughts, thoughts and feelings is so unique to art therapy. It's such a beautiful part of the process. I've seen people create and not realizing that was what was going on for them. Something quite almost traumatic in nature. Oh my God, I can't believe this is what came out today. And they, and it's like, let's just, do we need to close it? And then, or if it's in a box, I've done like boxes where people can keep things. It's like, do we want to open the box today? Is there something we're feeling healthy in a healthier place today that we can revisit? And again, without the physical object of the art, how do you, you know, doing that in talk therapy has its challenges. And so we, we get this, it's a blessing to be able to have these reminders, these imprints. Yeah. It's incredible how helpful it is to be able to take something out of your mind and, and body and, and just set it aside. I love the idea of actually putting it in a box. It's almost like you've contained the monster, like the Ghostbuster trap, and you're putting it into the building. Uh, and hopefully no one from the EPA comes out and lets it out. <laughs> I love your metaphors. Ready. Yeah, until you're ready. Exactly. It, like it exists. So much of what, what we go through, you know, sometimes we want to like forget things. Oh, I don't want to deal with that ever again. And the reality is it's a part of us, you know, mm -hmm. and we can't delete those parts. When you, when you try to, it, it takes a lot. Number one, it takes a lot of emotional energy. You'll feel zapped. You'll feel exhausted because you're pushing and shoving those thoughts and feelings away. So if you just let them be, give them an opportunity to exist and finding a way to not let them take over is like the ultimate goal, right? And so I think it's a, a great metaphor for what we do in art therapy. Yeah. It's also, I don't know, I feel like having a tangible something, whatever it is, while going through uh, any kind of therapy, it's almost like uh, going back to a trophy. It's like, look what I have to show. Like I was feeling a certain way and I'm taking steps to help myself and look at this thing that I have, right? I, I don't know why, uh, and it's not really a question unless you have like a thought about it, but um, it is, it's nice. It's, it's, it's a, a sense of, I, I can see it building pride that a person can, can build on. Yeah. Yeah. I, again, I think like we are the sum of our parts of our stories of our history and so when you can visually see those parts I think it does bring a sense of of pride you know the art therapy project does client art exhibitions where clients are invited to share their work and like when when they see their work hung on a, a gallery wall or recently you know um, a virtual exhibit online it's like there's a sense of pride even when it's something difficult and something um, maybe ugly or something traumatic. And so it's like, here it is. I'm, I'm putting, I'm giving light to it instead of keeping it in the darkness and hidden. Right. Absolutely.
Do you wish you were one of those thoughtful card people but don't have the time or energy? I don't know why I did bunny ears on that. Or maybe you had a personal assistant? I like to pretend sometimes when I'm running errands that I am my own person. I make up games in my head. I might be revealing too much about myself. But you don't need to pretend to be your own personal assistant. At least when it comes to cards. Because the Cardist Studio is your personal assistant. Let's set up a situation. You think, oh, I should send them a card. But things get in the way. You're busy. All you'd have to do is jump onto thecardiststudio.com and tell them exactly what just popped in your head and, and why. And you'll get credit for your thoughtfulness. Here's what they'll do with that information. They'll get your personalized message handwritten into the card and into the mail for you. And you don't have to save space in your brain for this character that you've created as a made-up personal assistant. This bit is really getting off the rails. <laughs> it's fast, it's custom, and it's a total life changer. Hey, you are a thoughtful card person now. Thecardiststudio.com. Thoughtful. Just got easy. And you can use the promo code ANXIETYPOD for 10% off your orders. Well, you mentioned that art therapy is in its infancy. I'm, I'm sure, like you're saying, even going back to early humans with cave paintings, there may have been, you know, uh, some aspect of uh, emotional trauma that they caused them to do that, right? But bringing it into the forefront and 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 bringing it into academia, do we know the story uh, of how it came to be a little bit? Yeah, so we, I should have prepared more for this question. No, so, it's okay. Um, you know, just in addition to cavemen, what they were without just trauma, but communication, mm -hmm. uh, they showed what's important to them, right? So there was all these facets of it. But so art therapy, I want to say, really came into its own profession around the 1950s. And there were a couple of different pioneers, both in the US and the UK, who came from backgrounds of either like art education. And then there was some like psychiatry that went in there. I mean, even thinking back to Carl Jung, who was, and, and Freud, there were dreams. I mean, there was archetypes. Those are all images. So these are all based in, in the roots of, of, of psychotherapy and, and psychoanalysis. And so really people started examining, I think some of the early research was on like inpatient patients who had psychotic diagnoses and their artwork, teachers, like I said, um, art education, evaluating children's developmental stages within an art making experience. And so so that's when it sort of first started to form. And, you know, today, you know, fast forward, we are in schools and hospitals and rehabs and community centers and uh, prisons, private practice, where we're really in most facets of mental health. We have a uniting, it's the American Art Therapy Association, they kind of oversee our ethical standards. We have national registration and board certification, and then we are licensed in about, oh gosh, I'm going to get it wrong because I'm not totally up to date. I want to say 15 or 16 states, and that's growing every day where people are use, going to legislators and trying to get our profession uh, under a, a professional license so that people can really see that there's value and uh, we're part of that community. So the evolution has been wonderful, and I love that art therapy kind of comes from a background of like a conglomerate of a lot of different areas of study. Um, and I think it shows the complexity of what we do. And there's a lot of uh, really interesting neuroscience research being done around um, really how the creative process and then specifically art therapy can impact the brain. What areas are lighting up and why? Uh, where are these memories that we have stored? How do we access them? So it's fascinating. It's a great field. It's fascinating. And, and it's probably like maybe in its adolescence, maybe not infancy, I would say like maybe adolescence, young adulthood. And I really have seen just an incredible explosion of, of more connection with it in the mental health world. That's great. Yeah. I, I often, I, I think about the person who maybe I was, let's just say 10 years ago, maybe even five years ago. Uh, and, and just being like nervous to actually open up and, and talk to people. And, and I see this as, as an option for someone like that you know, especially you, you work with people who survive traumatic experiences. I mean, I'm going to group those people together from the sense of nervous about opening up, right? And nervous about sharing. And, and if you just have to be like, okay, I just have to go to this place 
and I'm just drawing, right? Like I'm just, it's just, so, it seems like such a, an easier way as opposed to looking someone in the eyes and telling them your biggest worry in life. Oh, yeah, you just identified two like really awesome points. One, art acts as kind of this intermediary in a session, right? So you, yeah, you, like looking at someone one-to-one -one and, and it's adults, it's kids, it's everyone has some kind of difficulty with that depending on the, in the circumstance. And so here you are, you're given this kind of third object to focus on, to look at, to talk about. And what you're doing is creating a potential metaphor. You're creating a space where you don't have to say, and this is my difficulty and this is what I went through, you're able to kind of put that into symbols, into abstractions, um, into metaphors, and being able to discuss it with a little bit of distance, which kind of addresses some of those, you know, parts of ourselves that might have shame or worry about sharing the, those, those parts of our emotions. And the other thing is exactly how you started. It's like, yeah, you can go in and you with the art, I, I can't, I'm going to quote someone and I apologize, whoever you are, that I'm not yeah. citing you correctly. It's a revisiting of a, a, an issue rather than a reliving. So mm. with, you know, telling it and talking about it can be like totally overwhelming or re-triggering and bring you back to a bad place. Whereas creating art around it, again, gives you that distance. And so you're kind of like touching it from a distance rather than like diving right in. Mm. Yeah, that's so true. Oh my gosh. I'll share. I, I come from a, I have a pretty extensive improv comedy background. And one of the things that I've had to do more than once was five minutes direct eye contact with a stranger. Uh, I'm different because of that now. I'm a different person from before that because you want to run screaming from like, and never look back during the whole time. And then when you're done, you're like, oh, that wasn't so bad. Yes, it's like confronting that fear. And I think something like you mentioned before too, is just like, once you realize you'll survive and you're going to be okay and you're not alone and like everyone feels that way. And then you're on the other side of it. There's such relief. There's such a weight. I mean, I've heard this from clients over my years of work and just feeling some relief, just not holding on to that, whether it's the feeling or a memory or whatever, and just feeling lighter and having it out and being like, not that you're ever done with it, but that it's, it's, it's outside of you. You, you can check that, that you, you looked at that. Right. There's a, there could always be a monster under your bed until you shine the flashlight. Exactly. And there isn't. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Well, what, what do you think is the, the most important thing someone considering art, art therapy should think about or know? So like right off the bat, I'll get real technical. You want to find a, a someone with a good experience, the right credentials, a good professional. I think a lot of time people hear of art therapy and maybe people do art a therapeutic art making. You want to find a, if you're looking for professional, you want you want to find someone through that through the American Art Therapy Association website has a really good resources for that. Second of all, jump in. It's just like have that trust that you're gonna like not only be able to like deal with some things that have been maybe getting in your way, but it might be a really enjoyable process too. So many people have either again, like abandoned that creative part of themselves or never got to really develop it. And so, so many people, even while dealing with extremely difficult topics, find a sense of joy in creating. I think again, as, as adults, we lose that. When are we creating? When are we making something that didn't exist five minutes ago? I mean, it's such an amazing process. So if you are someone who wants any of that, this is, this is just for you. Um, and again, it ranges from everyday uh, regular stress and anxiety all the way to trauma from uh, five years old to 85 years old. It's not, it's not that everyone will get better with art therapy, but I do think for a lot of people, it is a missing piece of the puzzle that they've been looking for and didn't even realize was there. Right. Especially going back to what we were saying, if, if you don't have the words, maybe it's not words you're looking for. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know why I tried to say it like the one of the movie people in a world where you don't have the words <laughs> to talk about your depression. There is our therapy. <laughs> I like it, but it's so true. Like, it's so true. And before, again, before I discovered it, you know, I, I, I mean, 
no idea. And once it, once I looked into it, I was like, oh my God, where has this been all my life? Like eight-year-old Lindsay could have used this. Like, come on, like this was, this is amazing. Again, I think that we can be there to help a lot of people. So absolutely. I hope people who connect with it can figure out a way to, to get involved. Yeah, absolutely. Well, um, I just want to make sure, is there anything you think I'm missing uh, about your practice, art therapy more generally, anything you'd like to mention? No, I mean, I think um, I loved all of your questions. You're wonderful to talk to about this. I so appreciate that. If people want to learn more about the Art Therapy Project, you can go to our website, thearttherapyproject.org. We have all kinds of information about what we do and our different programs. We're also on like LinkedIn, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. Just find us there. And if you ever want to reach out, we're, I'm, I'm happy to talk. I know my whole, my whole team loves talking about this. So I think reaching out would be great. So awesome. I just wanted- and did you want to mention any of your social media or do you think it's best for people to I go really through? I don't have any social media. Okay. That, I mean, I, mean, talk I about- barely do. It's like, yeah, I need to get with it, but I'm not on No, I, I, I never tell people that they have to get on social media. Social media is a monster that if you're not ready <laughs> to tango with it, stay off of it and live with absolute joy. <laughs> yes. We have a marketing manager. I get to be the clinical director and do all of that stuff and do this kind of thing, which I love. That's great. Um, and someone else manages social media. I, I think that's the ideal situation. Yeah. You do. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, absolute pleasure talking with you. Yeah. Thank you so much for your time and, and let's stay in touch. Absolutely, Patrick. I can't thank you enough. And thanks to all your listeners for tuning in. Thank you so much to Lindsay. It's, uh, you know, it's so interesting. I used to not consider my mental health at all. And art therapy seems like a, an easy way for someone who isn't as in touch with their emotions to just sort of like ease into it, right? Like you're easing into a bath with a glass of wine. And yeah, thank you so much to Lindsay and, and reach out to her if you have any questions about art therapy or are interested in, in doing it yourself, giving it a shot. Okay, before I get to the weird thing that caused me anxiety this week, I want to remind you of my other podcast called Death Space Filling the Void. You can get it wherever you get your podcasts. If you're liking the show and you want to support it, you can make a donation through the Buy Me a Coffee link in the description. Oh, I didn't slur that time. Nice. And then a shout out to our sponsors. Their first off is Instacart. If you sign up for grocery d- delivery through Instacart, from the link in the description, it, that tells Instacart that this show sent you, which also helps support the show. Then there's my software tutor. If you want to get a little bit better about Excel or some other programs, you can do that. The link is in, the link is always in the description. And don't forget about the promo code pod 20 for 20% off. And the card is studio. If you want to be a thoughtful card person, yeah, you probably do. It means that that's a nice trait. They're offering the promo code anxiety pod for 10% off your order. So, okay. The weird thing that was causing me anxiety this week is causing me anxiety this week. You know, we just bought this house and, and, and we're about to get the, uh, our first hurricane here. Um, not really particularly worried or anxious about that. I guess what's, what's more interesting to me is on like the community Facebook page, you know, some people are like, all right, I'm doing this and this and this, let me know if anyone needs help. And then there's other people laughing at those people. <laughs> I mean, if they want to do it, let them do it. But like, you know, they're only like going out and getting like milk and eggs. I mean, and people are laughing at that. You're too tough to prepare for a hurricane. I mean, even if it's a one or a two, I mean, I think Hurricane Sandy was only a two. It's the storm surge, I know. But yeah, it's just, it's just like the arrogance of, of not being prepared for, for that. <laughs> I would never have to prepare for a hurricane. But hopefully it dissipates and it doesn't really affect people in Florida, Georgia, South Carolina too much. Well, as always, thank you so much for listening. Have a great week and I'll talk to you on Thursday.